Um, so I'm here to talk about how 13 years ago I started my business partner, Steve, uh, Ventro Media Group. Um, it's 13 years ago, no external funding, no angels, no VCs. And the reason talking through this is because nowadays the first thing people come to is actually saying, I need funding, I've got a start I've got an idea, I need money. And I think culturally what may have happened over the past 13 years is that business has come far more into the mainstream and you've now got things like Dragon's Den in the UK, Shark Tank in the USA, we've got The Apprentice, you've got the Social Network uh, movie. Now, certainly when I was growing up and uh, thinking about career choices, the, 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 it wasn't like that. But I think a potentially negative byproduct of that, and lots of positives come out, a potentially negative byproduct is that the default position is that, oh, I need funding for my startup. So hopefully by sharing how we grew to today $50 million a year run rate, um, without any external funding, without any angels, VCs, private equity, just a couple of guys, an amazing team, um, and a good business model, uh, that might help you or people you know. So what I'm going to do, a bit about Ventro Media Group. Um, most of you, before today, who knew, and apart from Ollie, who, who had heard of Ventro Media Group? I won't be offended. There's no, there's, oh, okay, there's one, there's one hand at the beginning, okay? You'll hear about why, um, although we're fairly sizable business now, uh, our main focus is a white label model. So we hide in the background providing the technology, the platform, and everything else. Um, but it's important you knew, we, you know, we started in 2003. Uh, grew it to, uh, by 07, we were doing about 250k a month revenue. Uh, three years later, gone up 20 million a year, 2012, 30 million, and 2015, up to 40 million a year. We've got 50 million registrations around the world. Actually, I think it's nearer 55. That's out of date. But the, the bigger thing is that uh, uh, this month we'll add about a million new people to our database. And they will be joining one of about 30,000 dating sites we operate around the world. Lots of rewards, which is, which is rather nice. Um, I didn't get any awards at school, can you tell? So, you know, the company's done, <laughs> done quite well, which is, which is wonderful. Um, and Ventro really sits at the, the crossover between dating, social, and lifestyle. These are some of our brands. You may have seen you know, TV campaigns for just singles. Uh, we've got smooch.com, a few others. Uh, so you may have know some of those. But our cash cow, um, and this is the important bit for how you can hit... It's a cute cow, isn't it? It's a cute cow. Um, it's how you can hit this level without uh, needing to be spending your own money, is we ad adopted a white label approach. So I'm going to take you through that, because it's important you kind of understand to take the lessons away. So white label dating model. Simply, we're the guys who make the cornflakes that you buy in Sainsbury's or Waitrose, Waitrose branded stuff. So we do everything in the middle, okay? What our partners are responsible for is the brand and getting people to the site. And what we're responsible for is the software, the database, technology, customer care, payment processing, everything else. Um, and the white label model is applicable to quite a lot of different industries. Um, and the real strength of it is that our partners, uh, they provide the brand and the customer acquisition, which is the expensive bit. So if you've got a startup uh, and you're, you're raising money, a good chunk of that cash is probably going to be going to acquire customers, right? Um, or to build the brand. Well, what if you don't have to do that bit? That's the benefit of the white label model. We charge consumers. The way it works, you may, uh, one of our partners, for example, runs KISS FM radio station. Some of you young enough may listen to it. I'm slightly the old end of the demographic. Um, but uh, there's a site on there, flirtify.co.uk. So the way it works is uh, Kiss FM put their brand, which is Flirtify, out onto the airwaves. Consumer hears that. The consumer thinks, man, it's good. I'm going to join that. They join. The consumer then pays. At that point, the consumer is paying Ventro Media Group. 
So we own the data, we own the billing relationship with the customer, but it's branded Flirtify, which is owned by the partner Kiss. And what we do is pay the partner a percentage of the revenue, typically 50%. So what this means is that actually our partners are incurring the customer acquisition cost risk. I'm sure there's a slicker way of explaining that, but hopefully you know what I mean. Okay? So the risk of acquiring that customer goes from us to our partner. Talk a bit about our story, uh, and then I'll really just, if we've got time for questions, be thinking, okay, why is this not applicable to you, and give me the opportunity to explain why it might be. Okay? So I was running a digital agency, rawnet.com, still going today, great agency, uh, but the challenges of uh, agency life is that you're constantly looking for the next uh, deal, looking, you know, trying to get a new one. It's difficult to get retained revenue. Um, we had spare capacity in between client work, and we wanted something that would generate recurring revenue uh, for us, because it's so much nicer when you know you can pay the bills. This is years ago, so back in uh, 2002. Online dating, interesting sector. White label was a compatible model with this sector. When you think about how you can white label stuff and how online dating worked, the two, the two fortunately worked together. Now, we built the first white label dating platform in around two months. It was a pretty simple platform, but it did the job. We needed to acquire members to build the database. Therefore, we needed money, because online dating is a marketplace business. So if you don't have a database, you don't really have a business. So the first thing we had to do is acquire members. We didn't have investment. We didn't really have any money. Um, we did know how to use credit cards. I'm, I'd inherited that skill from my mother. So, And this was back in 2003. Uh, there were so many credit cards available. Um, as we found out in 2008, that probably wasn't a good thing. Uh, but at the time, I was fresh out of university. I'm like, what? I just fill out this thing, and they, they give me like five grand credit limit. This is amazing. So we went out and got like goldfish, egg, mint, all unusual credit cards that strangely are no longer available. Um, and I, we weren't entirely responsible for the economic downfall of the banking system in the UK, but I think myself and my business partner are proud to have played our part in that. <laughs> and the way it goes, month. Now, what I would say, actually, is it's even easier now to get credit. Well, interest rates are very, very, very low, so now's the time to borrow money. And it's easier now to target consumers because of the targeting options that are available. At the time, who used Overture? Who's, I'm looking at anyone who's in their late 30s and above in this room, then, if you remember Overture. So uh, Overture was sort of precursor to Google PPC. We used Overture, Google. Didn't have Facebook, didn't have Instagram, Snapchat, the targeting options you've now got that you can target people based on, you know, if they checked in somewhere in Bristol and you want to run a Bristol dating site, that would be amazing. So actually, I think it's still relevant because there are options available today. Month one, we acquire the customer, so we max out our credit limit. Month two, we moved the debt from card one to card two. Month three, moved it, and we kept re, re, uh, uh, reacquiring. And then by month six, we could pay, the, uh, pay off the credit card from, from month one. Now, for the accountants in the room, now that's not a great thing to do. I accept that now. I'm a... <laughs> adult at the time. It was like, way, this is fantastic. Um, and look, I'm not going to deny, it's easier when you don't have a mortgage. It's easier when you don't have family and you can just do it. And the worst case is, you know, who <laughs> isn't? I was living at home with my parents for like 10 years, so it's quite easy. Um, so we used credit card debt. We measured, we optimized, we, we repeated. It was slow and steady. So that built our database. Okay, so we had a minimum level, and, and you know that cost us tens of thousands of pounds of credit card spent to build, build a basic database of members. Then we focused on the white label model. So once we've got this, we could go out to partners and say, "Hey, you know, you it's February. You're not selling any advertising at the moment, okay? Because all the FMCG companies have spent all their budget for Christmas, New Year sales, so it's dead time for you. Why don't you have a dating site on your website or over the radio or in your magazine?" You know, it's it's distressed inventory, effectively. And they did that, and they're like, oh, okay, we'll give it a go. And then three months later, they're still earning money from it. 
And then, then four months, they think, actually, over a four to six month period, they've got a return on the money they would have generated from selling an advert. And they've got their own dating site. It adds to the brand. And you know what? Think about the data you give to dating site operators. We know your height. We know what you look like. We know your education level. We've got, we know where you are. We've got so much insight in the customer. So it started getting very attractive. And we got uh, one magazine, Yours Magazine, which was part of EMAP, now owned by Bauer Media. Through a bit of luck, you know, worked hard and a bit of luck, we got that one magazine. And then it's so much easier once you get the one partner to acquire more, more and more and more. And the focus was building that white label model, getting more partners on, on board. Um, we, the use of B2C is, and the partner model, it's effectively an enhanced affiliate model. So it's the affiliates who own the brand. But this is applicable in a lot of other sectors where if you think about what you're trying to do, are you trying to build brand, technology, and database? That's a lot of work. So our, our model was, OK, we'll let others focus on the brand, and we'll focus on the, the technology and the database. Um, and actually, because we own the data, sometimes shared ownership, but rarely, we own the data and we own the billing relationship, we maintain the long-term value. So uh, we grew the business um, up until about 2012 to 2016. Our re we've, ha we've had our own uh, challenges, which I'll talk about for another time. And the reason I tell you we had the challenges is because we're through it now, back to growth. But uh, yeah, it's um, you know, one of the, the downsides, certainly, to not having funding is not having other investors you can go to when you, where you hit the skids or you have issues or anything like that to talk to. So. Uh, we went through it. We're now in a in a solid place. So, before any questions, some of the key lessons, you know, measured, balanced risk personally meant that we kept the equity in the company, and that in turn, uh, when I look at other entrepreneurs and startups that get diluted, the more diluted they get to, the higher the enterprise value of the company needs to be, and therefore the more difficult they have realizing that enterprise value. So by us having a good chunk of equity, it's, you know, we're in a good place. Um, the white label model, it means others incur the marketing risk, uh, and you basically outsource marketing to the people who are great at it. Uh, and because we have so many fantastic partners running so many sites, we have a wide distribution of risks. So our revenue comes through lots and lots and lots of little small sites, about 30,000 in fact, rather than one or two big sites, which is great. Um, the data ownership, billing ownership, that gives us control. We launched the product quick. So many entrepreneurs focus on getting the product just right before we go to market. And I see in the dating sector, you know, dating startups who are a startup for two years. And they're trying to perfect it and perfect it. And what they're effectively trying to do is put off the confrontation, put off that, that potential risk of it not working. So it's, I really believe in the fail fast. Get the product out, get it out to market, and test and learn. Um, and if you can look at ways of distributing your risk by hundreds of partners, thousands of sites, millions of customers, that's a pretty great place to be as well. Now, as I said earlier, I was going through any sort of uh, any questions, any comments. I'd, I'd love the opportunity to hear from you.